All right. So we're going to kick off now. We're going to get deep into some content. Our next session is all about what's next in computing. And we have a, a special guest speaker here from IBM. He's the senior vice president and the director of research. We have Dr. Dario Gil, who's coming up to join us. Thank you. Thank you. Buenos dias a todos. Uh, well, what a joy to be with all of you and to have the opportunity to host you uh, at IBM and to have a session with you where we have an opportunity to share a perspective on the future of computing. And uh, towards the end, also, we'll have an opportunity to have some Q&A. Uh, so think, think of questions as, as we go along. So first, let me tell you where I work. Um, this is just about half an hour from here, just 12, 12 miles north. It is the headquarters of IBM Research. It's the TJ Watson Research Laboratory, and it's this gorgeous building that was designed by Eero Saarinen, and, uh, who famously also designed the TWA building in JFK, the San Luis Arch, and you know, Bell Labs, and you know, many interesting and fascinating places. And uh, you know, normally in the building, we have about 1,400 uh, scientists and, and engineers and is the headquarters of um, a global network of laboratories that we have around the world. We like to refer uh, you know, IBM Research as a, as a brilliant family of uh, 3,000 uh, scientists and engineers. And, uh, you know, and over our history, there's been a wonderful track record. It's one of the world's you know, uh, great industrial research laboratories. Uh, IBMers have won them to you know, win six Nobel Prizes you know, over, over the decades. And it's a community of all sorts of background, physicists and mathematicians and computer scientists and designers and engineers of every kind uh, who come together around a common purpose. And the common purpose is to imagine and to create and to invent what's next in the world of, of computing and information technology. And when I give you a preview of what is coming these decades, I, I like to use this pseudo equation of that what's next in computing, it's bits plus neurons plus qubits. And uh, I'm gonna unpack a little bit uh, what those elements are. And we're gonna pay also towards the end some attention about the convergence of technologies and what it's going to mean uh, in the years ahead. But it's useful to reflect as we are gonna you know, push some novel ideas, uh, including quantum computing and, you know, and the advances in artificial intelligence, to reflect back to the foundation that has built the information technology edifice in which we've built modern society. And that, of course, is the idea of information. And uh, actually, that word of information is uh, of relatively recent coinage in the way we have come to understand it. And, uh, you know, and Cloud Shannon did a lot to uh, help us understand a very you know, well-known mathematician uh, from early in the 20th century. And he, he defined information as the resolution of uncertainty. And, and also, importantly, he gave us a theoretical construct with which uh, we have built modern computing and modern information technology. And that's where we're going to start this journey, with the word of bits. And, and that is that intersection between this idea of, of information and its mathematical representation. And famously, that is encoded on something that we all use every day uh, as a term, which is the world of the binary digit, the bit. And what he sought forth, by the way, this is an idea that you can trace further back to Leibniz, you know, and even beyond, that you could represent and encode any type of information, language, you know, music, and so on, through a binary representation, in this case, the zeros and the ones, and that through that abstraction, almost this platonic idea mapping of no matter what you say, I can map it into this world, and I can reproduce that information perfectly through mechanisms like error correction, gave us um, IT and, and gave us the world of computing. And in fact, we could see objects as different as an old punch card or DNA. And with the modern sensibility of having this abstraction of representation, we could say, ah, they're very different, but I know what they do. They're information processing systems. And actually have a way to theoretically describe you know, their behavior and anticipate uh, you know, how they encode information and, and you know, mechanisms for its reproduction, etc. And if you fast forward and you accompany with another idea, which was Moore's law, in this case, you know, not theoretical, but empirical, 
that you could integrate more and more transistors per unit area, and we've been doubling that for the last 50 years, you get to modern marvels of computing. So, I mean, as an example in here, this year we released IBM Z16, the latest mainframe system for IBM. This uses seven nanometer semiconductor technology. In the chip, the size of a fingernail, you can integrate 22 billion transistors. Uh, in there, you can process, in this case, you know, over 200 billion AI models per day. And uh, you can inject an AI model in the window of every transaction that you process, you know, with one millisecond latency. So these kinds of systems power the modern economy because it's the basis of transactional systems for modern banking, telcos, you know, central banks, etc. But it's an example of how sophisticated and mature this technology that we have built over so many decades. We've also come to appreciate, I think the world has come to appreciate, the power of chips and the power of semiconductors. Um, hopefully many of you have seen how central it's become to even uh, the um, you know, uh, government actions with the Chips and Science Act that was passed relatively recently, and the realization that uh, in the United States and, you know, and, and in the West, we've ended up in a situation where we basically don't manufacture the most advanced chips, right? We are leaders in R&D, uh, but there is a very significant appetite for investments to rebalance in the supply chain that has had consequences on everyday activities and manufacturing, right? From car making, to hospitals, to electronic appliances of every kind. So last uh, year, actually, we uh, revealed the first two nanometer technology. Now. So if I told you $22 billion in a, I mean, 22 billion transistors in a fingernail, that technology would allow us to have 50 billion transistors, to give you an example, uh, in the size of a fingernail. So there is a tremendous opportunity to continue to push the boundaries of the information technology and the computation that we know works and is the basis of the modern economy. But if that was the story that we're more familiar with, I want to share a perspective of what is happening with the second element of the equation, the world of neurons and neural networks and AI and what is happening with the world of qubits and quantum. So the field of AI, of course, uh, has been with us for a long time. Uh, I mean, to be you know, precise, since 1956, um, there was actually a very famous conference that was organized at Dartmouth that was sponsored actually by IBM, uh, and in which you know, that term was uh, introduced. And within the field of AI, we have a, you know, a subset of, of fields that we're all very familiar with, like machine learning, neural networks, within neural networks, something called deep learning. And, um, and the original idea, the inspiration, just like we were talking about Cloud Shannon before, is Santiago Ramón y Cajal. And Santiago Ramón y Cajal uh, is undoubtedly one of the great pioneers of modern neuroscience at the turn uh, of the 20th century, he was among the first to understand that in our brains we have these cells called neurons, and that these uh, neurons have these long tails called axons, and when the axons meet one another, they form synapses. And that those synapses are deeply connected to uh, learning uh, as a process uh, on that. And, and actually, you know, in addition to being, a, he won the Nobel Prize in physiology for that discovery, in addition to that, he was um, a wonderful illustrator. And I just show on the right-hand side, he would hand draw these diagrams and these beautiful books and exhibitions uh, that have been in museums around the world of the diagrams that he would uh, you know, draw looking under the microscope in which he understands like, the great enormous variety of cells, of neural cells that we have in our brain and, uh, and the neural structure that is present uh, in, our, in our brains. Well, it wasn't with a lot more inspiration than that, that beginning in the 1940s and the 1950s, mathematicians created an abstraction. And the abstraction was artificial neural networks. And we began to see diagrams like you see here, where every dot here represents a neuron. Neurons are connected to one another through synapses in quote, right? And you have many layers of this network. When we talk about modern day Deep learning at deep neural networks just means that we have a huge number of layers and billions of these neurons are connected to one another. And once you have this structure, when we say that in artificial intelligence or machine learning, as the term implies, it learns something, it means that by example, in this case by showing images of different animals, we are systematically going to vary the strength of the connection between neurons, think about it as the line, how thick or narrow it is, in such a way 
that there will be an output neuron that will only trigger when it's linked to the right animal in which we're making a query. As an example, is it a cat or not? You know, it will, you know, once it's properly trained, that neuron will only activate when it sees a cat, and it will not activate when it doesn't see a cat. And that process of learning, of changing the weight, gets done something through a process called forward propagation, in which you do a multiply accumulate function to activate or not activate a neuron, and then a back propagation process in which allows us through a derivative model to be able to change the weights. Without going into more details, is iteratively you learn by example. And that has proven to be an enormously powerful approach of, in this case, if we were learning a very simple task like um, uh, a digit in the untrained network, when we ask the neural network whether this is a seven, it may get it wrong at the beginning, but through this iterative process, we will adjust the weights until it gets it right. Once we've trained the network in production, it's called an inference mode. You're no longer training, you're just servicing right, a model that has been trained to deliver you you know, customer service or a dialogue system, et cetera. So what it is important is the abstraction that neural networks have been able to provide us. So in the way that the different layers of the neural network provide something at the beginning, at the low levels, for example, if we're recognizing images, edges to contours to ultimately abstractions like, you know, the entity itself that you're recognizing. So there's a hierarchy of learning that takes place as the depth of the neural network increases if you structure it properly. So that interesting idea for many, many decades, even though it had been present, didn't work very well. So actually, the field of AI was, um, went famously through booms and busts, like they call it also, you know, there were times around that, that um, you know, people didn't even want to say that they were associated with the field, let me put it that way. And, um, and really, the term itself only became popular in usage in the last eight to 10 years. If you were in the field in like 2000s and before, people didn't say they did AI, right? They would say, well, you know, we do, you know, to some degree, people say machine learning or analytics and so on, but they weren't so much in this space. And what changed is that in 2012, the convergence of three trends, yes, those algorithms that have been present with us for many decades and some advances from it, combined with enough computational power to train very large-scale neural networks, and crucially, enough data, a byproduct of the bits revolution, is we digitize the world. And it turned out that you needed lots and lots of examples to successfully train the neural networks. And because we had digitized the world, now we had loads of examples to do that, and enough computing power, also linked to Moore's law, and to that bits trend, and what resulted is that in a particular class of problems, in this case was image classification. So you had a data set that had a million images and you were given the computer the images and you say, give me a label as to what it is. You would have to say that's a truck or you know, that's a scene on you know, somebody swimming in the beach. You had to generate the caption of that. The best teams in the world, when you gave them that task set, is about 25% of the times the best algorithms in the world had an error, like they wouldn't be able to give you the task. And what you see in 2012 is that using these deep neural network techniques, uh, trained by example in the way I just showed you, it was the biggest increase in the history of computer vision in terms of accuracy and performance. And that really sort of captivated first the scientific community, and then from there it sort of expanded greatly as a methodology and part of the reason why you hear so much about AI is because of this technical journey of increasing the accuracy and the performance driven by these neural networks. But the process was laborious and expensive, meaning you had to generate a training set. So let's say you wanted to be able to generate a chatbot that did customer management and dialogue, let's say, with a customer. So you had to accrue a large number of interactions between, you know, let's say the, the employees supporting the customer, you know, create the transcription of them, and you may have to generate tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands or more of examples to train the neural network and then you could deploy. It. So that process of curating examples, labeling things, is called supervised approach towards um, AI. 
And one of the most interesting things that is happening in the last few years is this transition that we're beginning to see towards self-supervision. So I want to you know, give you a little bit of insight as to what is happening. And you know, an exciting new frontier in the world of AI is something called foundation models. You may have heard it referred to also as large parameter models, large language models. Maybe you've heard about things like GPT-3 and things of the sort. Around that, you know, I'm adopting the nomenclature of Stanford of foundation models because, and I'll explain why in a minute, why that term. But first, let's try to understand sort of like this evolution in AI, where we have gone from, maybe some of you remember it, like in the 1980s, there was something called expert systems, right, where people would encode knowledge rigidly. And they were quite sophisticated for narrow tasks, but they turned out to be enormously brittle. People constantly had to be adding very specifically hand-coded knowledge to be able to perform very specific tasks. So that didn't succeed. You saw, of course, the advance of machine learning. Uh, a good example of that is you know, classifiers of many different kinds around that that is commonly used in analytics. But a lot of encoding of classification tasks and features by hand by data scientists. The evolution of AI is towards increasing degrees of automation and increases degrees of abstraction. So with deep learning, the learning around that, remember in a computer vision task, for example, in a machine learning paradigm, you would go and say, I want to learn about what is a car, right? Say visually. And somebody would have to sit down and almost engage in you know, a philosophical reflection about what is the nature of a car. You say, well, the thing has four wheels, you know, and it has a roof, and it typically has metal. And, and you would create classifiers that you know, are good at detecting round objects, right? For example, the wheels of a car, etc. But in the real world, you encounter the car not always seeing all four wheels. Maybe you only see the front, or it's raining, or it's shadowy. And it turns out you're constantly adding tweaks and modifications to actually be able to conform to the enormous variations that you see in the real world. In the paradigm of increasing the level of abstraction and learning those representations automatically through a large number of neural networks, that learning happens automatically by nature of the structure of the neural networks. So you no longer have to be hand-tweaking things so much. You're learning things much more automatically. In foundation models, the key transition is you're using these large scale neural networks, but you're going to engage in a task of self-supervision. So how does that work, and what is the power? So the shift is going to be between these sort of human pa uh, power, large amounts of labeling, and pretty hard and expensive to do, to something where we are going to use some clever tricks to do automation. And I'm going to give you an example in the world of natural language. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to try to figure out how to create a representation of the English language. But in this case, we are not going to make an attempt to label large numbers of sentences by hand. So what we're going to do is we collect, in this case, 100 billion sentences. They could come from all sorts of sources. It doesn't matter that they're like structure, that they're written as a novel. They're just sentences in the English language. And we're going to play a trick with our large neural network. And that is, we are going to randomly omit parts of the sentence. And we're going to ask the neural network to guess what word I hid. So for example, in this case, I have it's raining cats and dogs. I'm going to take dogs, and I'm going to hide it. And I ask the network to guess it. So at the beginning, it gets it wrong. It says deer, you know, water, and so on. And I iterate until it gets it right. So now, I've done it for one sentence, and I get to do it for another sentence. So I pick another one. I have 100 billion of them. Remember, I have lots of them. So don't cry over spilled milk. So in this case, I hide cry, and I ask it to guess it, and I do this again. By the time I'm done with this game, I end up with a really incredibly powerful representation of the English language. Notice I didn't label things. Right? I didn't go by hand. I just hit things, but I know what the answer is. I, I just hide it randomly. I put it in memory. I get it. I know what the right answer is. And I just use that technique through automation to create this representation. It turns out that once you do that, you can create all sorts of downstream tasks. For example, once you have a model of the English language, you can do things like summarization, dialogue, right? Q&A. 
And you can imagine how you can embed that capability in all sorts of applications that we all use in our businesses for all sorts of things. In fact, and this is even like more powerful to reflect on, when you think about, well, what kind of math am I using there? And what kind of languages can this apply to? You come to appreciate very quickly that there's nothing special about this technique of applying it to the English language or to Spanish or Japanese. That languages in the world are enormously varied. You can use it to natural language processes, but time series signals that happens in financial institutions or industrial production is a language of sort, right? Like the machine is telling you something that you can read and interpret. Tabular data is a language of sorts. Digital interactions of a person navigating through websites and buying behavior, it's a language of sorts, right? They're talking to you, you know, not with English, but through behavior, movements, clicks, Code, software itself, of course, is a language. We call them programming languages, right? Chemistry, the diagrammatic things that we see on the thing, it's a language as well. So there's nothing on the mathematics behind the scenes that tells us that those techniques will not apply equally well to all of those spaces. So we have been building a comprehensive um, you know, infrastructure and software stack that goes from specialized infrastructure in terms of accelerators, for example, that you use to train large neural networks, to the entire you know, hybrid cloud and uh, scale out middle world platform built on open technologies to do everything from training to fine tuning to the inference step associated with these models across different modalities. So I want to give you an example and a provocation on the world of code. It's, we're all familiar with the fact that we know that software and code is the lingua franca of business, right? More and more. And that we encode all sorts of our processes and, of course, productivity through software. Well, the provocation is the future of code is going to be driven by AI. If you look at the impact that AI has had already on natural language, translation, Right? How many of you use translation between languages and so on using AI? It's commonplace. We're all accustomed to the idea also of if you're sitting in front of a word processor or an email system, the fact that you do you know, spelling checks automatically. Right? Uh, you've seen recently more like autocomplete. Right? You start typing, it autocompletes for you. Well, imagine now that world for software. You sit in front, you start, you know, writing your software and, you know, in your favorite uh, environment, Java, Python, whatever it is. And as you start, it's going to assist you in how code is written and how code is tested because we're going to treat it as a language. So I'm going to give you, and so across generation, search and retrieval, similarity analysis, translation, improvement, it is going to be driven by these advances in artificial intelligence that I just told you about. So I'm going to give you an example of one of, uh, you know, in, within a Red Hat uh, portfolio, there is, uh, you know, a core platform called Ansible that does automation for IT tasks. And within that, you use a language called, you know, a scripting language called YAML. And I'm going to show you a little video on something we just uh, announced a couple of weeks ago on something called Project Wisdom that helps this community of hundreds of thousands of people that are developers using this for uh, IT automation using these techniques that I just told you about to do that process of how you go and write and evolve code. So what let's take a listen. What we've added here is wisdom. And wisdom is our AI, and we're gonna see if it can help us automate deploying a web application today. So let's go ahead and dive in by uh, writing some tasks. So I think the first thing that we need to do is install Nginx and Node.js 12 on RHEL. So that's in natural language, And right? just this writing. is a, just a classic web application setup, um, sort of common for us. And, you know, this suggestion looks good. I What I will say is the Wisdom AI is recommending to us this block, and this actually looks pretty good to me. So we're going to hit tab, and that's going to accept the Wisdom AI's recommendation. Now, What's, what's interesting about this is the, the amount of time that we would have spent just getting to this point without the Wisdom AI's help, um, it, it, it would be non-trivial. Non -trivial. I think, you know, at least, you know, 30 minutes, hour or something like that. And, and look how far we've come. You know, in just a minute or two here, we've written out the entire 
entirety of our web application deployment, including handlers, web server configuration, uh, security configuration, Node.js applica application. I, I'd say this playbook is done and ready to be executed. Again, content generation is just the beginning of what's possible in automation with this artificial intelligence. Okay, so that's a good provocation to think about uh, the, the future of, uh, of IT. Oh, and uh, maybe, uh, sorry, if I can go back one second. One of the things around that is the key insight I want to also share with you is that this approach towards using these large-scale neural networks or neural networks with self-supervision is the central idea. Not everything has to be enormously large in the number of parameters. So one of the key innovations we've driven, right, there's different approaches around them with wisdom compared to Copilot and other things, is that some other examples out there use like 12 billion parameters to be able to train something like that. So we've demonstrated with just 350 million parameters, you can get better performance across the board than with these very large generic models. So a lot of the lesson is going to be around customization to the task at hand using the most modern techniques of AI as opposed to one model that will rule it all. Right? So that's a key lesson to learn about it. But the core techniques is what is important to understand. All right, so I'm going to get to my third and last part of the story of bits, neurons, and qubits. And this is the world of quantum. So if mathematics and information was bits, and biology and information was neurons, it is physics and information coming together that give us the world of qubits. And here, we're going to go back to an assumption that Cloud Shannon made which he separated that idea of information representation, the famous bits, zeros and ones, he separated from the physical implementation. And he said physics and information are separate. You actually don't have to worry about the physical implementation. It doesn't matter whether you use vacuum tubes or transistors or optical fiber or you know, wireless communications. How information is encoded and represented is independent of its physical manifestation. It turns out that that's not quite true. And there were a number of, of physicists, uh, you know, starting in the 50s and 60s, that were bothered by this separation between physics and information. And they started asking questions, the kinds of questions only physicists ask, right? So like, you know, is there a fundamental limit to how energy efficient computation can be? Asking questions about whether, you know, information processing could be, you know, thermodynamically reversible and things of the sort. And here's examples of Rolf Landauer, a great physicist who's IBM fellow, uh, at IBM Research, who hired Charlie Bennett. That's Charlie Bennett recently, not then. Uh, 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 and you know, he's also uh, an IBM fellow who recently won the Breakthrough Prize, and you know, you know, world world class quantum information theorist. And starting in that journey, they actually, um, them and others, came to realize that there is this deep intertwining between quantum physics and information, and how information is represented. And actually, I share this as a piece of uh, you know, historical artifact. The world's quantum information theory, the first time we know that they were written somewhere, this is from a notebook from Charlie Bennett. It's uh, 1970, right? So that's how long we've been working right, <laughs> on this topic in IBM research around you know, the nature of quantum, even though quantum computing now has come of age for many, many decades, right? They were just like you know, theorists and, and people thinking about it. What is important about it? What is the difference? So this is, uh, you know, if you plot performance, uh, you know, number of like, you know, floating operations per second as a function of time, we've grown, we've driven an exponential, right? Driven by semiconductor technology and advances in electronics, et cetera. The first thing to appreciate about quantum computing is that it is not just another step on Moore's law. Quantum computing is the first time the category of quantum, of, of computing with a capital C, is branching. Moving forward, we will have classical computers and there'll be quantum computers. So it's not every day that the thing branches itself, right? And, and that's enormously interesting. So it's not just a faster computer, it's a totally different kind of computer. The reason it matters is because as powerful as classical computers are, from a complexity theory perspective, they can only solve easy problems. That doesn't mean they're easy for humans to solve, but easy from the perspective that the number of variables you compute over is not exponential. There are many problems in the world in which the number of variables that you have to compute over are exponential. Famously, modeling nature, physics, chemistry, material science, 
the number of calculations is dependent on the number of electron orbitals present in the material. And by the time you keep adding electrons, you have an exponential in front of you. Their optimization problems are exponential. Factoring, uh, you know, a large uh, prime numbers that are linked to cryptography also are deemed to be, you know, exponential and really hard problems. So quantum, this, we don't make a claim that quantum will solve all hard problems, but that there's a subset of very important problems, of known hard problems, that quantum will alter the equation between what's possible to solve and impossible to solve. In those categories, what's interesting is not just faster, is that sort of binary thing of possible versus impossible. Broadly speaking, the areas are simulating nature, problems that have to do with physics, chemistry, material science. So the industrial sector will be greatly impacted by future advances in quantum computing. If you develop a better battery technology or a better fertilizer for agriculture, a better alloy for aerospace, there's tons and tons of applications that rely on modeling the natural world, of course, life sciences, etc. There's another category of data with structure. So a very famous example of this, of something that contains structure, is the problem of cryptography. And today, we make the world safe through cryptography by having, you know, you have your private key, which is a private number. I have my private key, that is another prime number. We multiply those numbers together. The product of that is the public key. Everybody has access to the public key, including the bad guys. But <laughs> if you just have the public key, and I ask you, find the two private keys, the two prime numbers, it turns out is a very, very computationally expensive problem. So you have this asymmetry with the ease with which you can multiply two numbers, very easy, and how hard it is to find those two prime numbers in the other direction. So that makes up for a very good encryption system. What's the problem? The problem is with future quantum computers, you're going to be able to solve that problem exponentially faster. So modern day cryptography is going to have to change to quantum safe systems. So that's an example of data that has structure, right? That public key has structure. And that structure is what I'm finding efficiently with a quantum computer. But there are other problems in machine learning and ranking in groups that is relevant. And then there'll be classes of problems for which you don't have an exponential speed up, but you have a significant speed up as well. Things like search, sampling, and you know, Monte Carlo optimization. So financial institutions of many kind are very interested in quantum computing because there's many of these classes of underlying problems that get used. These machines are real, right? And incidentally, they're very beautiful. Um, so this, we affectionately call them quantum chandeliers. Uh, we use superconducting technology at IBM. And uh, here's a quantum processor that sits at the bottom of a cryogenic system. So one of the coldest places in the universe is the bottom of a quantum computer, right, for us. So it uh, you know, operates about 15 millikelvin, almost uh, very close to absolute zero. And the way it works is that you, know, you sit in front of your computer, normal classical computer, you write your program, Zeros and ones go over the internet. When they get to our machine, we convert the zeros and ones to uh, tiny microwave pulses that operate about five gigahertz. The pulses go down the cryostat. They create the superposition, entanglement, and interference operations that are inside the quantum processor. We perform a measurement. We amplify the signal, uh, again, through microwaves uh, that come out. We convert them to zeros and ones, and you get your answer. So behind the scenes is this incredibly sophisticated uh, you know, system that makes it possible. And today, we have we built you know, more than 30 quantum computers. We were the first company in the world, first institution in the world, to build a quantum computer and put it in the cloud. That was May 2016. And since then, we have the largest now ecosystem and network in the world with over 200 institutions who are partners to IBM Quantum from startups to national laboratories, universities, Fortune 500 companies who are learning about this new era of, of computing. So 211 members as of you know, last week and uh, continues to grow. And, um, and what is fascinating is that it's forcing everybody to think differently, right? To reimagine what computing can be and to go back to a lot of assumptions we made about what could be solved and what couldn't be solved and what is sort of like under the rug, and resurfacing many of those things. And just to give you a sense of what's going to happen in this coming decade, this was a superconducting uh, qubit that we built in our lab in 2010. A decade later, 
That's what a quantum processor looks like. I mean, just visually, even if you don't know anything around that, how different things look like and how much more sophisticated things look like. And in fact, we were the first to release a roadmap uh, for this decade. And um, you know, next week, uh, we're going to you know, deliver the 433. Uh, qubit processor. We've gone from 5 qubits to 16. Last year we broke the 100 qubit barrier with Eagle. 433. Next year we're going to build a system with over 1,000 qubits and we have a journey to build machines with tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of qubits. And crucially, an entire software stack that goes from low level, the equivalent of assembly language in classical world, right? But this is in kernels to algorithms, to model developers that will not need to know any quantum physics. That's the good news. You will not need to know no <laughs> quantum physics to benefit from quantum, right? You'll just sit in your Python language, and there'll be libraries behind the scene that actually take care for you all of that. So that's the journey, to make it frictionless, right? Uh, uh, you know, a serverless approach to, to computing. And um, here's a vision of what these systems are going to evolve. Of course, it's not just about a machine. There will be quantum data centers and quantum supercomputers, where many of these quantum systems, here you're seeing an example of quantum system two, where you have larger cryostats with systems that will have thousands of qubits, surrounded by the control electronics, the classical machines that will feed all the information back and forth and the control to the quantum systems. And importantly, many of these systems connected to one another too. First classically, you know, and over time, also, quantum mechanically. So you're going to see the combination of quantum communications and quantum computing coming together in the equivalent of intranets that we see in data centers. But now, over time, we will see a quantum intranet. And further in time, a quantum internet as well, with quantum information is encoded even over large distances uh, around that. So um, one of the things that I mentioned as an implication is we need to change the cryptography of the world. So if you haven't paid attention to, to this, this is an urgent task for all of you and for all of us that we got to move from the current cryptographic standards to what is known as quantum safe cryptographic standards or post-quantum cryptography is also referred to sometimes. And this is a big part of our push to. So IBM Quantum is about cryptography and computing, right? Making the world quantum safe and unleashing the power of computing for everybody. So this is an urgent task that needs to be done. And um, so I'll wrap up with hopefully now you got a little bit of a sense of the possibilities of continuing to advance through semiconductor and systems bits. What's happening with neurons and self-supervision and the implication that that's going to have to all languages, particularly code, and what that is going to mean. And then the coming advances of, of quantum computing. And even though I didn't dwell on it too much, a huge part of the agenda of IBM research is going to be also to explore not only to push the limits of each technology, but to explore the implications of their convergence. What happens, so the true revolution of computing is going to be driven by the combination of all of these approaches and technology, working in concert in a workflow for solving some of the most important scientific and business applications that we confront. So it goes back to, you know, going back to Turing in this case, it gives us a moment to reflect of how much there is to discover, right? And we have so many aspirations for what technology ought to be able to do that. But this quest of discovery, of finding what's next, is really at the core of what motivates us, right, as a scientists and engineers, and it's something that it requires the collective effort of all of us uh, to make happen. So thank you. Let's create what's next. And uh, <laughs> questions? Thank you. Thank you. So I think we have time for a few questions or comments, if you have any. OK. The initial software applications? Yeah. So, so the way um, we have approached it is to embrace an um, open source approach to a lot of the core software infrastructure. So it's something called Qiskit. Uh, which stands for Quantum Information uh, Software Kit. And it allows you, it started with, like I mentioned, the low-level piece of it. So these are people that need to say, hey, 
how do you engineer the pulses, error mitigation, error correction. Then the algorithms, this feels like you know, applying it, for example, there's a new field that is very exploratory around quantum machine learning. Right? So these are people um, proposing new, vec new examples of super vector machines, but with a quantum kernel, as an example, a, a different way to formulate the problem. And then once those libraries of algorithms exist, people on top of that build applications like, and then saying like, well, how do you use machine learning to yay? I mean, you can use it for every software application. I mean, I gave you examples today of writing code or you know, having dialogue systems or you name it, or a classifier for a credit system or you name it. So, so the approach we've taken is not to start with like the end application because you gotta build all the foundations, but we have a clear understanding driven by our clients that basically these two sectors are going in very significantly. Industrial sectors or so companies like you know, Boeing or Mercedes-Benz or many others who are about, hey, I wanna apply this to engineer materials better, better things. So those are applications in that space, right? To do calculations that are embedded with other classical software that allows you to make better predictions of electronic properties and engineer better material. And the other one has been financial sector. There are many, many of the leading banks in the world, you know, and so on who participate in that. They're interested on things like the machine learning applications, a very popular one, risk and, uh, and risk assessment based because of the fact that you can do sampling differently than you can do historically. So you can sample from a distribution in a different fashion and that obviously has implications for risk. So that's another example around that. So, so but, um, you know, we'll be happy to share with all of you more. Uh, we have also, you know, a book on the quantum decade with many, many use cases uh, that all these companies are pursuing. But today I wanted to give you much more of like understanding the why, what's, what's underneath, because the number of applications over time will be as varied as the number of applications in machine learning or so on. Right? So I know that we are running quite short on time. So I want to thank uh, Dario for coming up. You know, as uh, as Marty McFly would say, that was heavy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That was heavy. <laughs>